So we've got death, taxes, and hair loss. Guaranteed. And your nose and your nose wow. and your ears grow. Okay. Yeah, I know I've noticed that actually. Hi. What's going on? Just the usual. Do you um, have any stress in your life? Um the usual stress. You know I have a lot of stress. And you know, like you're all it's always something with your family, with your kids, with your whatever, you know, and you're just pulling your hair up. Segway queen. I know. Look at me working on my segway. And um, fortunately for us, our guest today is Dr. Robin Unger, and she is a New York City based doctor who is dedicated to hair restoration. So look at that. You know, uh, I might be pulling my hair out, but I can learn how to, you know, get it back. Robin, do you want to give us a little background on yourself? How would you describe your your job today? I know you are obviously a doctor, but your job today and your what you're specializing in, can you give everybody a little bit of insight into what you do? Sure. So I started about 25 years ago, kind of hard to believe. Um, and I started in hair restoration, which at the time was mostly surgical. Um, you know, there were a few medications we could offer patients. But once we were done that, the only option was a hair transplant surgery. Um, and at that time, there were very few women doctors in the field. Um, there were very few doctors that wanted to treat women at all. And so I had actually about 40% of my surgical patients were women. Um, but over the years, over the years, we've come up with uh, regenerative therapies that can be helpful for women. We've got the word out to women that prevention is key and uh, proactive treatment is really important. Um, and we have other options in the like medical treatments. So I now, when I consult with a female patient for the first time, I have a whole host of things I have to go through. Whereas in the beginning, it used to be you can try Rogaine or have surgery. And that was that. Like when, when you see people now, like you were just mentioning about kind of preventative measures. Um, we do want to get into what the treatments are, you know, surgical, non-surgical, but preventative measures. Because we're all here, you know, some of us have lost it when we were pregnant or after pregnancy or breastfeeding. Like in my case, like all of this, just like after I saw breastfeeding, I'm like, oh, okay. You know, um, or maybe, you know, as we get to middle age and all, what could we kind of be doing to prevent as much of that as we can? Is it possible? Is there prevention? So to a certain degree, yes. Um, and although it's not my specialty, one of my first and strongest recommendations is to speak to a specialist about hormone replacement therapy. And what we see is there's this dive in estrogen um, at menopause. Um, and estrogen is protective. It's protective for our hair. Um, so it helps protect against the androgen effects, um, which basically cause the same thing in women as they do in men, which is this recession in the temples and the, um, hairline region is sometimes thinning back here. So, um, you know, uh, being on hormone replacement therapy can certainly slow that and potentially, uh, slow it for a long time. So what do you say? You, you mentioned at the beginning, when you start, when somebody comes in, if I come into your office and say, hey, Dr. Unger, like I'm feeling like I'm getting a little bit thin around, you know, here and it's receding and things are happening and I'm feeling it's coming out more, my, my hair's coming out more in my brush. Where do you start with me? Okay. First thing I say is I believe you because so many of the women have been poo-pooed by the doctors. You know, you have plenty of hair. What are you talking about? Uh, first thing I say is I believe you because there is no ulterior motive. There's no benefit for a woman to come and say, I'm losing my hair. She's not getting narcotics from me for that. She's not getting, there's no reason. So that's number one. 
And then I usually go into the whole like hits history, medical background, you know, what is going on systemically that could be contributing to it. So it's not just hormones, it can be nutritional, it can be sleep, it can be stress, it can be other things in your life that are all contributing. And then wait, I have to get something. Oh, and then I take it. So Oh, it's a this, camera lens attached to your phone. It's it's actually a microscope. This is a patient that actually has a kind of hair loss called alopecia areata. But when I do this little scan, I can see right there she has alopecia areata, which is autoimmune, often stress correlated. But I can tell her right away. I'm not telling her it's because of our hormones, even if she happens to be going through menopause because I can see this. Now, sometimes we do need um, a biopsy. So there are some other autoimmune conditions that have really increased in the population, namely uh, one called lichen planopolaris and another one called frontal fibrosing alopecia. And they tend to affect women more often than men and postmenopausal women more often than premenopausal women. So I will get a patient sometimes who's been seen by multiple physicians and been told she just has, you know, age related female pattern hair loss. And she does not. She has one of those conditions, which we short form FFA or LPP. And those, if you don't catch them in time, can be permanent. So we, you know, we can't break wow. it back. So it's really important to get a doctor who knows how to diagnose why you're losing your hair before they start treating you for your hair loss. Well, and also if, if we're talking about middle age, right, people and hormones, particularly because you're saying that's a certainty. It's not a certainty that I'm getting alopecia, but it is a certainty that my hair is going to thin as a result of hormones, correct? Okay. So alopecia, I'm going to clarify this because everyone thinks alopecia areata is the only alopecia there is, but alopecia just means hair loss. So we can have alopecia due to menopause. We can have alopecia due to autoimmune disorders. So yes, it's true. Menopause related alopecia is the most common form and it's pretty much guaranteed to happen. And the difference between, you know, one woman and another woman and when they show up in my office is usually how much hair they had to start with and what age they go through menopause. So the treatments, like you have a few different, like, I mean, there's surgical treatments um, and how, like, is everybody a candidate for all of those? Are there things you might recommend more one for the other? So, I mean, I usually will start with once we've reviewed uh, maybe nutrition and hormones, I would say those are kind of the baseline we want to have optimized before we start most both or simultaneously. Sometimes it's just vitamin D deficiency and vitamin B12 deficiency or iron deficiency. We do see, especially more often in people who are vegan or vegetarian or who have, you know, some of the inflammatory bowel diseases, they sometimes are low in iron. So I'll review nutritional and try and uh, supplement as needed. And then I'll usually look at the medical therapies. And, and that's basically because they're inexpensive and they're non-invasive and they often will be effective. So we'll look at the uh, minoxidil, which is Rogaine in the in the topical form or the oral form of that. Um, and we can also look at the DHT blockers. Um, there's one called dutasteride. And DHT definitely plays more of a role in female hair loss after menopause. So you're talking about topicals and pro protect, uh, potentially oral supplements. And those are actually prescription medical treatments. And we go through potential side effects or anything like that. Um, and I always tell women, this is a medical condition like any other. We take baseline photos and we bring you back about 
nine months later and we take repeat photos. It's either working for you or it's not working for you. If it works, you'll, you're, you're motivated to stay on it. If it doesn't work, you're stopping it and we'll try something else. Would you then move into these non-invasive procedures or is there, you know, are some people, you, some people, can you just tell they're beyond the non-invasive and have to go straight to some kind of transplant? So uh, a lot of women don't need transplant anymore because we get to it early enough. One of the beneficial things is women are a little more aware of the hair loss. So they tend to come in a little earlier, which means they have a lot of these little fuzzy hairs. Those little fuzzy hairs are miniaturizing hairs. So miniaturizing hair is finer than your hair used to be, and it grows to a shorter length. And that gradually progresses until it no longer, the follicle no longer produces a hair. So that's called miniaturization. And what we seek to do is stabilize and reverse the miniaturization somewhat. We have the medical therapy. We also have the regenerative therapies. And those include what Lana tried, which is the Alma Ted. And that uses ultrasound combined with a peptide that's made in a lab to kind of stimulate hair growth. Um, it also includes PRP, platelet-rich plasma. So those are the things that you offer in your in the RU Wellness. So yeah, I recently opened RU Hair Wellness, which is kind of my my sister uh, spot. Um, it's the non-invasive treatments. It's the more kind of looking at things more holistically. We have the Alma Ted, which is the ultrasound device that uses a peptide made in a lab. We also have something called the Caraviv, uh, which is a scalp facial kind of thing. And we have the Fotona, um, which is a laser that also can stimulate hair follicles. Tell us about the products. What products will help? There's actually three lines I carry here. So I'll tell patients, I'll give them one of these. I actually show them how to use shampoo and conditioner. Shampoo is for your scalp. Conditioner is for the hair. So what you do is you put the shampoo in your hands, you go like this, and you go under your hair, under the hair, like this. You work it in, and then you take this little scalp massager, and you just do... You're, you're just using pressure, but you're not doing too much with it, you know, like that. And you leave it on your scalp while you do the rest of, you know, some sort of shower chores. And then you rinse it out. And then you take conditioner again in your hands like this. And you work it into the rest of your hair, but you're away from your scalp. Now, in addition to that, wow. if you have a dry scalp. You may want to use a scalp treatment that stays on the scalp. So that will be done after your shower. So you put that, especially black women, Lana, tend to have drier scalps, but also, yeah, but also all postmenopausal women have much drier scalps than they used to. What's interesting is that you're telling us how I did not know all this time, and I've been in an industry where I'm getting my hair done by professionals all the time. I did not know that, you know, how you should be using the shampoo correctly. No, really, no. Like all of this time, and and just you know, you like you would. Um, I exfoliate my face because that yeah. gets rid of all the dead stuff, so you don't get as many pimples or all those you know little bumps you might get on the back of your arm and whatever. But have never thought about exfoliating my scalp. But that absolutely true. Like, why would that not that changes the game. I'm, I yeah. first time I'm ever hearing this. What a revelation! Yes. So explain how do you moisturize in middle age if we're getting these drier scalps? How do we moisturize our scalp? I just tell people find something that says scalp treatment. That's the leave-in thing, and you put it on your scalp. I really avoid any that have a crazy long list of chemicals. So let's pretend we get to, we, we're at RU Hair Wellness, 
And at the end of all of the different um, treatments, I still have a problem. Then what happens? If you still have a problem, uh, it depends on whether it's rapid shedding or it's just obvious areas of hair loss that you can't camouflage with styling techniques or other things. Um, and then there's basically, well, sometimes we'll, we'll offer the scalp micropigmentation before that. Oh, wait, yeah. I wanted to talk to you about that. That yeah. was really interesting. Um, because, well, you tell, tell us what it really is. And I'll tell you our hack from the fashion industry, which is not okay. as good. So I was actually going to mention your hack, you know, how sometimes for photos, they put uh, eyeshadow on your scalp or powders on your scalp. So you don't... Or waterproof oh, mascara. Oh God. Okay. Um, so you don't see the scalp showing through. Um, so it makes your hair look thicker. So we actually have an amazing team, two women who come in and put tiny, tiny, semi-permanent ink dots on your scalp. And they kind of mimic the look of a follicle and makes your scalp whiteness look less white through your hair. Um, so it can create a really nice camouflage of the thinning areas. So sometimes that's the right option for women, especially in the back here um, where, where the hair has been lost, but it's actually... You know, it's the fact that it goes in multiple directions that lets you see through to the scalp more. That's really more the problem than it just thinning. Um, so it's particularly good for that area. And then we have hair transplants, which always work, but they work in a limited zone. So if they tell me, well, this bothers me, then I'm like, okay, hair transplant won't solve this. If they say to me, when I wear my hair back in a ponytail, these are so thin, that's really bothering me or my part line and they'll, you know, they'll choose a part. Oh, I like to part my hair on the side. And when I part it on the side, it looks too thin. So um, then we kind of concentrate the graphs in the area that's most important. And then yeah. when you're doing that... Um uh, where does the hair get yep. taken from? I mean, obviously from the person's head, you can't transplant hair from yeah. another part well, of the body. Can. There's a zone here. Yes, back of your head. Right, between your ears that is the most uh, androgen resistant area. Then I'll sometimes take from here, uh, from behind or above the ears, some of the finer hairs if we're creating a hairline because the hairs in the back are coarser. So that's the end game. The transplants would be- It's not the, the end well, game. Stop you know. telling me that. <laughs> no, that's the, that's it. If, if everything else has, has not worked for you and we really have areas that are cosmetically important, we can't camouflage them, then we do a transplant. Got it. That's the last resort. That's the last resort, I guess. The end game is getting your hair back to a state that you feel confident, beautiful, and in your element, whatever that might mean for you personally. One of the things Rebecca and I had talked about, were, we were just wondering, are there any kind of styles, hairstyles that um, are, you know, better to wear to kind of prohibit hair loss or the ones that might, you know, lead to you losing your hair or it breaking off, you know, faster. The tight ponytails, super tight ponytails, the ones that ballerinas use and gymnasts use and actually sometimes um, black women with the, with, my mom, with the my hairstyles mom that, yeah. of the braids that are pulling the whole front. Um, those are generally not great. Um, because they they pull on the hair follicle. It's called traction alopecia. Um, so and and the extensions do the same thing. They add a lot of extra weight to the follicle. Oh, okay. So not great overall. Um, the hair straightening procedures basically are breaking all the bonds of your hair 
and then gluing it back together straight. If you took a china cup and broke it and then glue it back together, it's not as strong as it was before. In terms of processes, um, I will say that my guidance to patients is anything that stings, burns, or hurts your scalp while it's being done is not good for your follicles, period. Basically everything I do to my hair, <laughs> everything you're like lifting all of my hair procedures. <laughs> I have I can't do anything anymore. Number one takeaway is it is far easier to hold on to your hair than try and bring it back. So be proactive, make sure you don't ignore the signs and do everything that you can um, to avoid being in a position where you're trying to bring it back. Along those lines, you should have your hormones in balance and your nutritional uh, your basic nutritional status uh, evaluated. And then I guess the other takeaway was just, you know, about the hair care. I can't believe that I have lived on this planet for 54 years and I did not know all of these things about my hair, which has been with me for most of that time. We have learned so much. Our listeners are going to learn so much. Uh, oh, my pleasure. It's nice to hang with some Toronto girls. Yeah, again, Toronto girls in the house. Yeah.